work on the island. On and on over the hills, the art glass and the jam jar. Autumn sunshine, magnificent and all shining through. Stop off with art glass for a couple of jars of mussels and some potted herring in case we get brownies before dinner. Crack is good. Heading towards Coney Island. Now look at the side of your fist. The sunlight comes streaming through the window in the autumn sunshine. And all in all, time of going to Coney Island, I'm thinking. Wouldn't it be great if it was like this all the time? I've always had some idea of trying to explore the relationship between poetry mysticism, poetry religion, poetry nature, and nature and healing. In the beginning with me, it was unconscious. I started writing songs at a very early age. I didn't have a clue what I was doing. Later on, I was trying to find a way to connect what I was doing with my contemporaries. I discovered, however, I was writing what some people call transcendental poetry, other people call it mysticism and poetry, other people call it nature poetry. Why was I writing this kind of material when my contemporaries weren't? So I wanted to find out where I stood and what tradition I came from. Well, eventually I found out that the tradition I belong to is actually my own tradition. It's like being hit over the head with a baseball bat. You find out what you've been searching for, you already are. This writing actually comes from the places I used to go. For example, when I was a kid, the area I was brought up in. And Thread took me from there to uh, research the poets like Yeats and Keats, Wordsworth, Coleridge, and eventually to the Glens poets of Northern Ireland, for example. Last year, I got together with some of today's Irish poets, John Montague, Seamus Dean, and Michael Longley, to talk about these ideas. We met at a place called Lugalaw in the Wicklow Mountains, south of Dublin. Lugalaw is the home of Gareth Bryan, who has been very much part of the Irish and poetry work through his record company, Clatter. But I think you were perfectly correct when you felt that nature actually has a much more important influence on people than they realized. Subconsciously, I was drinking all this in, and that's how I became interested subsequently in poetry and traditional music, which mm -hmm. in a way string, springs from the land. I think having access to the country was very, very important. Yeah. And I never really feel very comfortable just being in a city. I always feel like a, there's a strong connection between c being in the countryside and the creative process. I mean, as far as getting creative ideas or, you know, ideas for songs coming into my head, it, it always seems to happen more when I'm in the country than when I'm in a city. And uh, I think it's also got something to do with having space, having a certain amount of space for to you know for your mind to open up to receive and now i wander in the woods when summer gluts the golden bees or in autumnal solitudes arise the leopard colored trees and um, Van's question about the, the healing power of poetry or of art uh, i think it's an important one i hold on to um, sometimes quite desperately, the notion that there are redemptive and healing powers in art, and that uh, we can't measure the effect it has uh, immediately, uh, we can't measure it within a generation, uh, but um, finally um, it's an accumulation of uh, refined, uh, courageous responses to life, whether it be in a song or in a poem. 
now, buttoned up with water in my shoes, clouds around me, I can through mist that misconstrues read like a palimpsest my past, those landmarks and that scenery. I would like to think of poetry as a way of singing the universe, creating the universe through a song that actually will, you know, in some sense, at some stage, come true. I'm appalled by its emptiness. Every valley glows with pain as we run like a current through. Then the memories darken again. In this Irish past I dwell like sound implicit in a bell. Look what they're doing to the whole landscape. Look, look at this. If you bring the bulldozers out, uh, they can change all your, they can change all your sacred all your sacred places with a giant show. There's also uh, there's also a move to take away the place names in the north of Ireland, you know? The townland. Yeah, 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 the townland. And we could lose all this all this uh, absolutely magical stuff. That's one of the reasons uh, poetry is important. Um, I mean, to preserve, uh, to preserve the name. Tuberous tentacles of oak, hawthorn buried pig nut, the topsoil of a living shape of earth lifts like a scalp to lay open slipping sand shale, compressed veins of rock. One is not being escapist when one writes uh, about the, the landscape. I mean, I'm not writing about the landscape um, just as uh, the, the birds and the bees, you know. Um, the, uh, the flowers and uh, the, uh, the birds and uh, the lay of the land, the shape of the fields, uh, all of that is saying something about my own inner self. And I hope if I am uh, I'm honest uh, to my inner self, uh, I'm being honest to something wider. I have turned to the landscape because men disappoint me. Animal, plant or insect, stone or water are every minute themselves. They behave by law. I am not required to discover motives for them. I live my best in the landscape, being at ease there. Well, this is a poem that, that, I, that I wrote a couple of years ago that was uh, turned into a song eventually by just putting music to it. Um, it's in the tradition of the Glens poets um, of Antrim and County Down, and it's called I'm Tired Joey Boy. I'm tired Joey Boy while you're out with the sheep. My life is so troubled, I can't get to sleep. I would walk myself out, but the streets are so dark. I shall wait till the morning and walk in the park. My life is so simple when one is at home and I'm never complaining when there's work to be done. Well, I'm tired Joey Boy of the makings of men. I would love to be cheerful again. Sit down by the river, watch the stream flow. Recall all the dreams that you want you to know. Things you've forgotten, slipped you away. Pasture is not greener, but mean. Love of the simple is all that I need. I've no time for schism. knows this place almost as well as Gareth. They have been friends since the 50s when John began writing poetry. There are these marvelous poems in early Irish, uh, not too far away from here at Lindelof, uh, you know, monastery. And uh, um, in those monastic settlements, you know, the monks would be copying down manuscripts, and as they were working, they'd hear, they'd hear a blackbird, and they'd just write a little poem on the edge of their manuscript. And it's very present in all our manuscripts and in all, in all that early poetry, there's the, there's the presence of nature. There's the loveliness of the land of Ireland, as you mentioned continually. A wall of woodland overlooks me. A blackbird sings me a song. No lie. Above my book, with its lines laid out, the birds in their music sing to me. The cuckoo sings clear and lovely voice in his grey cloak from a bushy fort. I swear it now, but God is good. It is lovely writing out in the wood. As I was saying to you, Van, this morning, the landscape of Ireland is what's really permanent. 
and that we'd come out of it and we'd go back into it. And all these other, all the other little bothers we have along the way, um, uh, you know, the land underlies all that. Yeah. I think the way we slowly cut ourselves off from uh, all, all the instincts that we had and we still have as animals has been obscured by, uh, by technological progress. So we're beginning to, uh, we'll, begin, we'll begin to kill ourselves off inside and to kill everything that was around us. So we have to reverse that process. And we have to refine, we have to refine the animal inside us and in the instinctive side inside us. I am wind on sea, I am wave in storm, I am sea sound. And seven horned stag, I am hawk on cliff, a drop of dew in the sun, a fair flower, a boar for valor. I am salmon in pool, lake on plain, a hill with ditches, a word of art, a piercing point that pours out rage, the god who fashions fire in the head. In ancient Ireland, there were four ways of achieving uh, supreme knowledge. And one was the way of loneliness, which is also called the Hill of Silence. And I won't tell you about the other three for the time being, just to keep you uh, on your toes out there. So this poem is called the Hill of Silence. It's, it's the path which was followed by some of the, of the old Gaelic poets like uh, Egon O'Reilly. And it's a way of being healed by nature through loneliness. From the platform of large raised stones, lines appear to lead us along the hillsides. Bog top softening beneath each step, bracken and briar restraining our march, clawing us back slowing us to perception's pace. Two, a small animal hawk starts and leaps us away, and a diligent spider weaves a trembling silver web, a skein of terrible delicacy swaying to the wind's touch, a fragile silken scarf as vain translucent leaf. Five, this is the slope of London. This is the hill of silence. This is the wind's fortress, our world pole star, a stony patience. Six, we have reached a shelf that surveys the valley. On these plains below, a battle flowed and ebbed, and the gourd spent warrior was ferried up here where water and herbs might staunch his wounds. Seven, let us also lay ourselves down in the silence. Let us also be healed. Wounds closed, senses cleansed, as over our bowed heads the mad larks multiply, needles stabbing the sky in an ecstasy of stitching fury against the blue void, while from trump and top, cranny and cleft, stop soft-footed, curious, the animals gather around and start to spit. If you start to spit, then you can do it. It seems there was never a time when nature wasn't central to Irish poetry. Still south I went, and west and south again, through Wicklow from the morning till the night, and far from cities and the sights of men, lived with the sunshine and the moon's delight. I knew the stars, the flowers, and the birds, the grey and wintry sides of many glens, and did but half remember human words, in converse with the mountains, moors, and fens. Seamus Dean is both a poet and professor of literature at University College Dublin. In fact, much of Irish politics and history has been about the land, you know, the land wars, the possession, the dispossession, the repossession of land. The relationship between that that kind of, if you like, political possession and dispossession, and the imaginative possession and repossession that you find in poets like those I've mentioned. That's to say that, um, you know, to repossess something imaginatively actually might be a way out of uh, the feeling, which is frequent in Irish, Irish writing, the feeling of being not only dispossessed, but of belonging to something which has been fractured, broken, which is discontinuous. But time and again, 
the redeeming gesture in much Irish poetry is to say, but nevertheless, through the landscape, through an imaginative act of possession, one can in some way reconcile, cross all the borders of time and place, cross all of those borders and find some imaginative locale in which mm -hmm. you can say, here, here we are and here we are in possession again. Not of, you know, so to speak, a united Ireland, but an Ireland that is not a political entity anymore, an Ireland that is, that represents a sort of a healing unity. Going northward, I would watch the fields falling below the sun into increasing darkness. Light has sculpted a deep silence between mountains and a leaf from the wind shudders like an autumn compass, north, north, north. I am unwilling to go further but your death has brought the fields, sodden with light, flooding between a gap in the mountains with the bruised tang of the sea. And I must go on, my anxiety like a raider scanning the landscape for the distance between feelings across death, northward. Michael Longley lives in Belfast. A lot of his work is written in small cottage in County Mayo in the west of Ireland. The important thing about a poem is rhythm. Um, you know, the rhythm of a, of a song, uh, the rhythm of a poem is like the heartbeat. That's it. Yeah. It's the, the body, it's the life of that particular mm -hmm. work of art. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a rhythmic failure in a song or a poem, it dies. It doesn't resonate. It's had it. No, yeah. it's dead. I was lucky enough to gain access to a part of, a um, very remote part of my own. Mm -hmm. And uh, gradually over the last 20 years, you know, I've been uh, exploring it. It's important for me to get off on my own occasionally. Do you find that you um, have to do that? I think it's essential, the writing. I mean, it's... it's um, do you have any have kind to. of country retreat? Um, well, I, I think I, I, wherever I happen to be, you know, I just sort of take off. I mean, sometimes in this, uh, in this cottage, which really is very remote in County Mayo, uh, I suffer from a, a loneliness, which uh -huh. makes my stomach churn. And so, uh, in order to ease that, sometimes mm -hmm. I write. I mean, this uh, poem uh, describes this rather forlorn uh, action of uh, leaving the cottage for a honeymoon couple. Mm -hmm. I've been there in my own. I'd left the cottage perfect for the honeymoon couple. Um, the only thing I could think of leaving them was what was difficult to obtain. Uh, it was the middle of winter, two buckets of lake water and uh, some turf. I have hidden a key under the dry stone wall for lovers to make after me a home from home. My gifts, turf and acryl, buckets of lake water. Their witnesses, waders gathering for Greenland, the Arctic and pebbly nests below the snow line. I sleep on the other side of the hill from them. Brilliant. You like that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like the, uh, yeah. the hypnotic, you know. Oh, well, that's just my voice. Yeah, that's it. It's uh, put anyone to sleep? <laughs> no, I mean, not in that way. It's, uh, you know, in a uh, soothing way, you know. My black hills have never seen the sun rising. Eternally they look north towards Armagh. They are my Alps, and I have climbed the Matterhorn with a sheaf of hay for three perishing calves in the field under the big fort of Rock Savage. The sleety winds fondle the rushy beards of Shankaduff, while the cattle drovers, sheltering in the feather in a bush, look up and say, Who owns them hungry hills that the water hen and snipe must have forsaken? A poet! Then by heavens he must be poor. I hear, and is my heart not badly shaken? There was a sort of hermetic seal across the Northern Irish mouth for a long time, and it finally broke with people like Kavanagh and yourself, I think in the early days, actually naming the Garbahi, the glass drumming. And, it, you know, the moment the name appeared, people actually began to recognize, that's my experience. Mm. Also. Also, and it's no longer, it has now been resurrected. It's no longer buried. It's no longer anonymous. It's no longer so small that it's not important. It's it done without any sort of consciousness. 
as well. Yeah, done naturally. Done naturally, yeah. as in, in, in Vaughan's early songs and your poems. And the, the landscape issue is still alive here, but I'd be saying in a more general sense then that what differentiates art, or at least what art would like to differentiate itself by, is the notion that in art you have shape, you have form, you have articulation. And if you can articulate pain, you're not overborne by it. And uh, that, that, is the, that is the triumph that is involved in it, and that is its healing power. Now you said yesterday, Van, that when you were, that when you were growing up in East Belfast, that you felt close to the country. Well, well I was actually, in, Belfast, well, I was was actually in a yeah, part of East Belfast that was actually in the country. It was close to Blenfield, Castlereagh, Cherry Valley, mm -hmm. Cumber, Newtonards, Bangor. It was actually, you know, like growing up in the country, it was, it was a suburb of East Belfast, but it was surrounded by countryside. It's like an almost emphasised country, isn't it, when it's uh, in the suburbs. I mean, I was brought up in suburban Belfast, but there were fields there, and making uh, little alleyways through the long grass. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, building building uh, uh, tree houses in, a, in an enormous spreading uh, crab apple tree, mm -hmm. yeah. um, which was close to, a, to an ordinary road. I mean, did you? Did, did you oh, have I some remember. Of that? I remember building a treehouse. Yeah, definitely. And what would uh, what would Van Morrison's territory be? I mean, I would mar mar mark out my territory as uh, the top part of uh, top part of Avenue, along uh, a bit of the Malone Road, mm -hmm. then uh, what's now a golf course, and then uh, the wooded slopes of the Lagan. Well, my territory would be. Um, I see Castlereagh Road, uh, Basebridge Road, Woodstock Road, Bloomfield Road. Well, I'm caught one more time. To oh, there's Craigie. Up on Cypress Avenue. Caught one more time. Up on Cypress Avenue. When I return to Belfast, I'm reminded that it's a city that can't escape nature yeah, enclosed by hills and I'm sea full of trees and parks. The poet Gerald Don and I both went to the same school and share this attachment with nature. When you view this domain, armful of clouds, look for the ledge of a leaf on which a spider spins its exits and entrances. I will be there too when the time comes, trying very hard to listen to what has been said about this, that, or the other. And that takes you all into Newtonards, down into Stankford, and around, around the other side, then you've got the, the coast. Harland and Wolf. Harland and Wolf. He's afraid of Harland and Wolf. Yes. And the twin gables, what do you call them, the gantries? Uh, mm. Goliath and Samson. <laughs> yeah. You remember the man that used to teach woodwork and he had uh, he used to rub uh, wood, wood, some wood potion into his head to make it shine? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but I hope he's not watching it. <laughs> yeah. But there was two approaches on Torrance Field. You, you would have come in the other side where the trees are and then you have, but you have lyrics from all around here, songs from all around Oh, yeah, I've got a song, Orange Field. You've got Orange Field? On a golden autumn day. On a golden autumn day. Yeah, I'm going to sit on the back. I'm going to, I haven't actually done that as a poem. But, uh, yeah, I put, in one of my songs, I've got this thing about, the line about uh, uh, sitting in orange tree, sitting in the classroom. Looking out the window. I used to sit in the classroom and look out my window and dream. Yeah. yeah. Then go home and listen to racing. Yeah. yeah. I used to do that after school. Yeah, yeah. Listen to Ray Charles. Used to look out my classroom window and dream. So how do we tie all this up? These landscapes, it finds its way into the work of poets and singers like a common language. 
So that although we speak in different voices with different intentions, there's a greater effect, greater than the parts, an effect that we might call healing with all its different meanings. You know it carried me through. Yeah, it lifted me up. It has filled me. Meditation, contemplation, too. Got to go back. We got to go back. Got to go back. Got to go back. For the healing. 